welcome everyone to the October Feller Check-In. Um, we're going to get started here uh, very soon. Great to see some familiar faces. Dale's in the house. It's always good to have someone from Arizona. So, I think, uh, I hope everyone's holiday season's getting uh, off to a great start. Um, I think we're going to get started. And with a few housekeeping uh, tips before we jump into the program. Um, one thing, just want to remind everybody, um, make sure when you're asking Q&A, um, you put it in the Q&A tab. Um, if you ask any questions in kind of the chat, um, you'll be invited to ask that uh, or to place it in the Q&A tab. We've got lots of eBay teams on hand to answer your questions and they'll be answering those only in the Q&A area. Um, we're also gonna tackle a few submitted questions um, at the end of the presentation. Um, if you wanna comment or chat with fellow sellers, please be sure to use the chat and remember to select the toggle for all panelists and attendees, um, or it might say everyone as well. Um, um, so we have a great agenda today, um, a great way to kick off Q4. So due to the success of the Forrester um, uh, sessions at eBay Open, and I think many of you probably attended those, um, we've invited back Vice President and Principal Analyst from Forrester Research, Sucharita Kadali, uh, to give us an update on the holidays. eBay's Vice President of Fashion, Cheris, will give a category update and discuss secondhand commerce with forest analyst Michelle Beeson. But first, we'll go through some eBay seller updates leading into the holiday season. Nate Hayward, Senior Manager Shipping for North America, will cover some of eBay shipping and carrier updates. And Jeff Mashad, Director of Digital Advocacy, will give a quick overview of upcoming changes for small businesses. I know everyone is looking forward to the shipping update. So Nate, over to you. Thanks, Brian. Um, thank you guys for being here today. Uh, I'll share some shipping updates around holiday season, what we're, what we're seeing, what we're expecting from the major carriers and their networks this holiday, uh, what we're doing at eBay and what we'll ask of you guys as sellers. Can go to the next slide. So, First off, thank you. Um, we know shipping's hard, and you guys have really hard work uh, all around shipping. Um, shipping's been in the news a lot this year, all confirming that things are hard. We've got global supply chain slowdowns uh, across the board. You probably already know this and you feel it. And ultimately, this also impacts uh, small package shipping. And how you can get the right inventory out for buyers uh, is just so important this holiday. And so I just wanted to start out by thanking you again for all that you do in this space. Next slide. Here's what we're really seeing in the carrier networks today. Uh, UPS is really largely in great shape. Uh, they've done a good job in the last months. We're seeing strong performance when it comes to capacity they've got and on time. USPS, they've also shown some really strong improvements in this last quarter, and we're seeing the show up in the numbers and the on-time performance from them. Uh, but last year was really rough. You guys probably all remember um, a holiday period with USPS, really, really tough year that they went through. What we understand from USPS is they have now more things in place so that they, you know, they're trying not to be in the same situation that they had last year. Uh, they've got more staff, more people, more equipment, they've added facilities, they've added trucks. All of these things are a really positive sign. We're seeing that show up in the numbers, but we'll have to continue to monitor how this looks as we enter holiday. Um, I can't promise that it, that it will be better than last year. We're, all the signs seem to point that it will be but we'll just have to stay really close on this together. We're all over it. We're gonna be communicating with you. Um, and, and you know, time will tell, I suppose. FedEx, 
uh, FedEx network is really struggling right now. They've been having a really hard time maintaining on-time rates. They've called this out as a result of labor shortages. They've shown positive movement in the labor situation over the last months. Uh, they've been able to meet their hiring goals. They're bringing more people on, uh, but their numbers are still really lagging. And so we're you know, working with them how we can to help make sure that we've got the right capacity and how we can support them in improving the on-time rates. We're pushing them to keep those hiring numbers strong and get the right staff in place to support our business this holiday. And we'll also have to, you know, see how this plays out in the holiday. So that's what we see right now. Um, you know, people are saying, carriers are saying, uh, analysts are saying, holiday shopping starting early this year. So get your inventory on the site now. You'll see buying um, for holiday starting now and continuing. And, and it really is showing up earlier than ever. Uh, I think the main message I want to give to you guys is we're going to we're going to keep monitoring. We've got the right connections in with the carriers uh, and we'll we'll be doing our job to understand what the carrier networks are and keeping you guys informed. If we go to the next slide. I wanted to share with you guys what we are planning to do this holiday. So we're really, really focused on our delivery estimates, how they show up on the site. Uh, we've got daily communications with all the major carriers to understand their networks, to know where the detail, the delays are in those networks. We've got rich data that's coming in from all the carriers around their networks, around their capacity, around their on time, what pockets of the country are performing, which pockets of the country aren't. Uh, and we're updating our delivery estimates automatically on the site so that we're giving buyers the best delivery expectations. Um, we'll communicate also with you guys. We'll provide you updates via seller news announcement, podcasts. We've got some functionality this year where we can put updates on our eBay label printing pages uh, with, with information about the carriers and their networks. We'll be leveraging all of those ways to communicate you with you guys. And we'll, we're, we're gonna work to get those communications out to you as quickly as possible. Um, I'll also share with you here the peak surcharges. We've just communicated peak surcharges for USPS uh, on our seller news announcement page already. UPS, they've, they've got no peak surcharges this year on eBay Labels platform. And FedEx, we're working to understand still what their peak surcharges will. We expect to share an update with you guys next week. Um, so that's what we're doing this year. To the next slide where I wanna talk about what we're asking sellers to do to prepare. Follow our best practices. We've just published a really great shipping holiday guide. You'll see the link here um, in the chat. Uh, got some really great information in that holiday guide. Check it out. Um, Take a look at what we're, what we're sharing with you there. High level, we're asking and not recommending you adjust handling times to buffer carrier network delays. Stick to your handling time that you can achieve. We'll take care of updating the, the delivery estimates on the site with the carrier information that we're getting from them about their networks. It really is actually harder for us when you try to buffer your handling times to account for carrier delays. So we're just asking, please don't adjust your handling times. Do and say what you can achieve. Uh, also communicate with your buyers, be proactive with them, help them with their challenges, should any arise this holiday. You guys do a great job at this already, just keep that up. Um, keep in mind the carrier cutoff dates, keep your handling time as short as possible. Offering choice and delivery speeds is always one of our great recommendations for extending that holiday shopping by a handful of days. And communicate with us. What are you seeing? What are your challenges? Um, those are really what we're asking from you this holiday and really looking forward to um, how we just have success this holiday together. I'm gonna hand now off to Jeff Michaud. He's gonna talk about um, the 1099 case. Thank you. Thanks, Nate. Hi, everybody. As mentioned earlier, uh, my name is Jeff Michaud, a member of the eBay government relations team. And so 
Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about two things. I'll be honest, the first thing I'm going to discuss is a plea for help. And if you want to go to my next slide, that would be great. Um, there is a provision that was recently added to a bill in Congress, the American Rescue Plan Act, that reduced the reporting threshold for 1099Ks. And essentially what that means is a 1099K, if you're not familiar with it, is a tax document you get it at the end of the year if you've sold above a certain threshold. Traditionally, for years, uh, the threshold for online sellers per marketplace was 200 transactions and $20,000 in GMV. In a bid to, to raise money to support the American Rescue Plan, they've actually dropped that threshold to no transactions, so zero transactions, essentially your first transaction, and $600 in GMV. And so this is problematic for a number of reasons. First of all, this means eBay is going to be forced to send 1099Ks to people that shouldn't necessarily get them. That's gonna force eBay to start treating very small sellers, even medium-sized sellers like businesses. Um, uh, there are some privacy concerns that we have with this. For instance, there's a requirement that we get social security numbers from all sellers, and we will then keep those social security numbers. We don't wanna to have to do that. I'm sure you don't wanna supply your social security number if you don't have to. Um, the heart of the issue is we're going to end up sending people 1099Ks for non-taxable transactions, right? So, for example, many used items are not taxable. Sort of the tax rules are if you sell something for less than you bought it for, you don't owe any tax. It's kind of a general rule. So we're going to be sending out forms. It's going to be very confusing for people. People are going to turn around and, and, and have confusing conversations with the IRS. So it's bad all around. We're actively fighting this and trying to get it changed back to something close to the original level. But legislators always listen to their constituents more than they do representatives of a Fortune 500 company. So we've also started a grassroots campaign. We're gonna drop this link into the chat, but it is ebaymainstreet.com slash 1099K. Very simple grassroots campaign. Here's the plea. I'm asking for you to participate. You go in, you simply put in your name and your physical address. And then you can choose to send a letter, a tweet, or place a call to your federal level legislators. You can do all of those things. You can do one of those things. Super easy. It'll take you five minutes, and it'll help us out greatly. We've already had, since we launched the program earlier this year, we, uh, sorry, earlier this week, we've already had about 18,000 sellers participate, but we need more. We're hoping to get double that, at least, to make an impact in Congress. So that's my primary plea. The other thing I want to share with you is not so much a plea, but just something fun to share. The GR team, the government relations team, has a program called the Small Business Ambassador Network Program. And this is a program made up of sellers across the country and other parts of the world uh, where we operate that work closely with the government relations team to talk to legislators about legislation and policies that affect people's ability to buy and sell online. It's a way for us to introduce legislators to actual sellers who are also their constituents so they can talk about policy issues. Um, there's a number of benefits to the participants. We have events that we do. Of course, there are uh, a meeting with your legislators, sometimes locally, sometimes in Washington, D.C. We have a lot of communication channels, and we promote, promote our S-Band members' eBay stores regularly, so there are some benefits for you as well. Um, and again, we'll drop the link in the chat, but if that is something that sounds interesting to you, I would encourage you to apply, and that is at ebaymainstreet.com slash S-Band, S-B-A. So those two things, those two uh, links are in the chat. Again, if you could uh, participate in our grassroots campaign, I would be forever grateful. And with that, thank you for the time. I'm gonna hand it over to Brian. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Nate, for uh, those great seller updates. Um, I'm sure we're gonna hear more about shipping in the month ahead. Um, so all sellers, you know, please watch out for that on seller news announcements. Uh, for any uh, any updates, um, and now I'm happy to welcome and introduce our uh, our eBay eBay Vice President of Fashion, Cheris Marquez, who will give a quick fashion category update, followed by a discussion with Forrester Research about secondhand commerce. And for those sellers who aren't familiar with Forrester, they're one of the most influential research and advisory firms in the world. For Forrester helps leaders across various markets, including technology, marketing, customer experience, product, and sales functions, use customer obsession to accelerate growth. 
Their unique insights are grounded in annual surveys of more than 675,000 consumers, business leaders, and technology leaders worldwide. Rigorous and objective research methodologies, include, including Forrester Wave evaluations, over 52 million real-time feedback votes, and the shared wisdom of their clients, including eBay. And we're very excited to pass their expertise and learnings onto you, our sellers. Sharis, I'll kick it over to you to begin the discussion. Great, thanks, Brian. Hey, everyone, I'm Charis Marquez, as everyone has said, um, and I'm the VP of Fashion here at eBay. Super excited to virtually um, see all of you guys today. I have, I know that there is a significant number of fashion sellers, which is always, always fun to see. So hello to all my fashion sellers and hello to everyone else. Um, I've been here about nine months now. And you know, when I joined, I was just really excited about eBay's position as the originator of resale. And that's what we're going to talk about today, re-commerce um, specifically uh, and resale overall, which is what we all do. So I think it's pretty exciting. I know that some of you reached out with questions about some trends for both men and women and wanted to share a bit of data so you can see on the screen there where we are and where the business is. From a, on a year-on-year -year perspective, we, we are growing. You know, in fashion, we had had some challenges, but we're really coming out strong. COVID and our continued momentum has continued. So we are really excited about that and thank all of our sellers for really making us successful here. So you can take a look. There's a whole bunch of stats here in terms of our top search terms. You can see the Nikes, Adidas, New Balance, a lot of the brands are sitting here. And then athletic shoes, our ASP and clothing and athletic shoes has stayed pretty consistent. But um, getting more momentum, want to see more. Uh, and we're going to talk to you today about how to make this next season successful. Some other things that I'd love to call out is, is just around our focused verticals. So sneakers and watches, which really fall into the luxury space. In our first half of the year, our luxury sales hit an all time high with an increase of 30% year on year. Um, we saw triple digit growth in sneakers. We saw 30% growth in our watches areas. We sold over a million watches. So we're continuing to see that momentum. And what's interesting about our conversation today is that when we look at watches, pre-owned watches contributed 80% for the U.S. sales of U.S. sales came from 80% came from pre-owned, which is super you know, interesting. We're also seeing a lot of growth and a lot of where our growth is being driven when we look at sneakers more deeply is also in pre-owned. So excited to, to see that momentum in re-commerce and resale. And as you guys know, we've launched authentication in handbags as well and seeing a lot of momentum there. We've sold a million handbags on eBay in the first half of 2021. So that's five handbags every minute. So we're seeing, um, just some really great momentum there too, and can't wait to ultimately expand our authentication program. We're gonna talk more about that, but first I, I know you guys wanna hear not necessarily all this from me, but from Michelle Beeson, who is an analyst with Forrester Research, and she has an expert perspective on the rise of consumer adoption of shopping resale. So Michelle is focused on digital trends and commerce strategies for consumer facing brands, including luxury. Her role is to help brands understand the changing consumer behavior and its impact on business. So our conversation today is really going, we're gonna talk about with the holidays and fashion really on top of mind, the rise of re-commerce and resale and the things that we're all seeing in the news. All of this stuff about scarcity and supply chain, which we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, and we're gonna talk with data from Forrester and also eBay and Vogue Business did a recent survey and we thought you'd find some of that data interesting. So Michelle, so thrilled to have you, super excited um, to hear from you. Wanted to talk to you a bit about a report that you that was recently published on the rise of re-commerce and resale. Can you share with us some of those initial key insights? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for, for having me join you today. Um, so that report, bearing in mind, I focus on um, clients that are consumer facing brands and larger organizations. They are really looking into sustainability, secondhand. There's an increasing consciousness around at least consumers wanting to act on their values, really concerned about 
their social and environmental impact of their consumption habits. And as part of that, brands are increasingly looking at sustainability, um, getting heads of sustainability, looking at their supply chain. But part of that question within circular economy is the issue of secondhand. And it is a you know, very, very successful ecosystem in and of itself. And brands are grappling with the idea of how do we get a part of this? not only for you know, the opportunity to, to get involved in the sales and the revenue, but also to get closer to some of their customers and have a broader reach of customer engagement and you know, be, be part of the action. Um, so this report is really looking at the different reasons why brands would consider re-commerce and the different approaches that they might take that have different levels of responsibility. Um, but I'm conscious that we've got, we've got a slide on the screen with lots of interesting numbers, and this is, um, Forrester's latest survey from this year um, with US consumers asking specifically why they buy used or secondhand products. Um, and what I find very interesting is that the highest, the, the largest proportion of answers pertain to price or value. And after that comes the uniqueness of product and the environmental impact. So, you know, in the US, there's still this sense of value and price and not just that the elements of sustainability are around re-commerce. Um, and it's interesting if you look at the, the UK and France of this similar data, you can see they also, that the largest proportions are interested in, and say that it's because of the, the value and the price, but sustainability comes up higher than product uniqueness. And that's something that we see as well, that European consumers are a little bit further into, you know, really, really acting and being very, very concerned and aware of sustainability and environmental impact. And that's coming in the US, particularly with younger generations. And so do you think this whole pre-owned thing is a fad or is it or a long-term trend? No, I don't think so, because it's especially if we if we look at values more broadly and consumers are increasingly factoring values into their decision-making. And by values, I mean, not just sustainability and environmental impact, but social impact, politics, you know, what are the values that a brand holds or what are the activities in their supply chain? How are they making those products? But that was already happening before the pandemic. So there's a sense that just the context of the pandemic has moved people to be more concerned about these issues, but actually this was emerging beforehand. And there's a consistency in terms of the growth of that, uh, you know, awareness and concern that suggested it's not just a, a, you know, fleeting issue in the zeitgeist. It is something that is there. The, the question is, you know, to what extent and what contexts, because it, it's great to have all these values, but sometimes consumers can always afford to act on those values. But when we talk about secondhand, that's not necessarily the same the same issue as you know general purchasing and and you know buying more sustainable products and potentially paying more for them. Right. No, I I totally agree with you. I know um, eBay saw in partnership with Vogue Business. Our survey had shown that a significant percentage of fashion and luxury consumers are already buying them, but a lot are saying we're going to continue. This is becoming a more than more than a trend or a fad and and so i think both of our sets of data have have shown that that this is something that's here to stay it's already there and it's going to increase so the people who are doing it today are going to continue and that there are a lot of people who are going to start getting into the game as well mm -hmm. so i'm i'm curious kind of on your thoughts on on what's driving the increased acceptance and adoption for it so we know more people are getting mm -hmm. it we believe it's a trend because of this values but but why do you think people are accepting it more yeah, I think it's a combination of factors. I think that it's the increasing conversation in society around sustainability and the the you know attitudes that we have are just shifting because it's it's talked about more. But also, you know, interestingly, with brands kind of getting into the game of, of e-commerce and talking about sustainability, you know, they're actually promoting in some senses e-commerce more generally. So you're more likely to see mention of it, you know, even if it's at the very least a brand, you know, claiming their, their targets to reduce carbon offsetting, it starts the conversation that connects to, you know, secondhand re-commerce. 
Um, you know, and also it, it's been around for a long time in the more luxury brands of, you know, the, the high quality, um, unique products. And it's interesting that it can extend into newer categories as long as there is and the, the product quality and, and um, longevity of that, that item as well. Um, so talk to me a bit about what you're seeing in terms of authenticity and where, where does that fit? Yeah, well, I mean, speaking of luxury, that is one of the big concerns, right? Especially if we're talking about marketplaces, um, you know, like eBay, it's a slightly different context than we're talking about Amazon. However, when we are asking consumers in the U.S., um, you know, are they concerned about counterfeit on marketplaces? 50% are. And then another 47% are concerned about product quality. So in the context of secondhand commerce, where often it is peer-to-peer, -peer, or you know, maybe there's the opportunity to have an intermediary check, or I know that, that you guys have you know, the, the refurbishment and, and guarantees that are coming into the conversation, that is all helping. Um, and, and even brands, bigger uh, activities, especially luxury brand groups around circular economy, their practices on authenticity, thinking about blockchain, you know, authenticity, NFC authenticity, that if they are doing that from the beginning, that then starts an opportunity when that product becomes, you know, resell um, opportunity, there's a new level of ability to you know, think about the authenticity and the proof of, of the, the origin. Definitely. I mean, we have for sure seen a lot of benefits through authenticity or authenticity guarantee. And the, 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 the categories that we are able to touch with it, um, we start to really see to help build that trust with, with consumers. So I'm um, mm -hmm. glad that everyone is catching on and glad that, that we're also a part of it and we're, we're able to build those relationships with our consumers and also provide um, that bridge between buyers and sellers because it is becoming really important for all all marketplaces. So we definitely believe heavily in authenticity. Talk to me a bit more. You, you spoke a bit about um, just sustainability. Um, talk to me a bit more about what you're seeing from a sustainability standpoint, whether it be brands or, or consumers. And I think you talked a little bit about that, but would love to just understand from an environmental standpoint, how are people thinking and feeling? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, from a consumer point of view, and it, you know, it links to just the opportunity that you know sellers have on eBay with secondhand and, and re-commerce, that there's just so much more concern about you know what what is the, what is the product what what is this origin you know is it what is the carbon footprint of that and so you know and that also acts on you know the shipping opportunity so you know we were talking earlier about all the different shipping options the speed especially on holiday. Um, and of course, you know, maintaining the customer experience of that is, is key, but it also relates to why customers are the decision process that they go through. And if you are, you know, if we look at our consumer surveys over the years, by and large, it's, it's the same answers that the, the biggest impact on decision making is around the price and the how quickly they can get hold of the product and for what cost, so shipping costs, shipping options. But then after that, it's product quality. So making sure that you have the product quality and are showcasing that, whether it's secondhand or not, it's very key. But then within that consideration are still the sustainability of shipping options. And we're seeing that come up in Europe of, you know, it's, it's still the fact that price and product quality are the, the higher you know, answers and the response options when you're asking consumers what influenced their purchase. But, you know, it also things like, you know, the, the environmentally friendly shipping options, um, you know, looking at what I've got here, the, the ability to purchase locally. So what is the distance of the shipping? How, you know, what's the impact of that? So when we talk about sustainability, it's not necessarily the obvious of, you know, the, the materials or the repurchase. It's also within the pre-existing customer experience and interactions that everyone on this call is having with their customers. And even if it's tangentially, it's still connecting to that values conversation that's happening for consumers. Definitely, yeah, values are so important right now. That's great. Um, so let's 
shift a little bit um, with what's happening right now around the scarcity and you know what are you what are okay. you seeing there and I think we've we've all seen the issues around you know supply chain management getting products not just necessarily across markets to, to their consumers, but even, you know, just making them and getting them across the world. Um, and the, the impact that that's potentially going to have, especially as we come up to the holiday season, um, you know, there, there's only so much that, you know, brands and, and retailers can do with new product. You know, they have what they have and they can get it to where they can get it. If they can't, it's a matter of what else can I offer as the alternative or, you know, just, just losing the sale potentially. And so, you know, in some ways, if we're, you know, thinking about eBay, it's, it's an opportunity um, for, for that, you know, the consideration of, of secondhand and, and alternative options for, for gift giving. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we're seeing it also, it's, eBay is uniquely positioned for a moment like this um, because of the, the inventory we already have on the site. So, People have always looked to us for finding the hardest things to find, and that's soon going to become almost in every category. There will be difficult, difficult things to find. So when we get right. these enthusiasts that come in um, for pre-owned, pre-loved, any of those, any of those types of things, I think people are going to think differently this holiday season. And um, our recent Vogue business survey, which you have the, the information that I think we're trying to make more clear for you shows that, you know, it backs this up. People want access to, to rare vintage classic items. They want to get exclusive products. They want to find products that are sold out everywhere else and finding products from previous seasons. So even if they don't necessarily want to find previous or new, I mean, our platform is still really well situated for that. So I think it should be a great, yeah. great season for us. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's interesting that generally consumers are much more savvy and willing to do the work of searching for the information of, of knowing what to look for. So the opportunity of even just, you know, looking at how products are presented, what information and detail is there can make a real difference because that's, you know, what consumers are looking for in terms of the product quality, the product specifications, is it meeting, you know, their expectations and what they're looking for. And they're willing to to look for that. That's great. And so I guess with the rise in resale being so strong and all of the different things that are happening right now, where do you where do you see it headed? Um, I mean, generally, I think it it's going to be a part of the conversation in circular economy and, and sustainability. Absolutely, um, from from big brands and retailers. I don't necessarily think that suddenly there's going to be massive competition for, for you know, everyone on this call and brands, all brands coming into the fold of trying to be, you know, manage re-commerce of their product end to end, um, you know, or, or certainly it would be alongside the existing peer-to-peer -peer ecosystem and marketplaces. Um, but certainly it's absolutely part of how brands are thinking, even as they're designing and creating products of you know, designing to be remade or designing for longevity um, and having that as part of their strategy when it comes to responding to these increasing concerns from consumers around value, sustainability, impact on climate change. So there's a knock-on effect that will you know, affect this community here in, in the longer term of all the actions that brands are taking more broadly around how they are developing products and, and selling. That's great. Um, do you have any final thoughts on how sellers and sellers should actually leverage this surge and the things that, that brands are already starting to work on? Do you have any suggestions for this group? Um, and I think it's, it's what I've already said. There's much more around just thinking about you know, what consumers are, are looking for and a lot of the, the, the detail that, that you can showcase to help them you know, find in searches and, and find what they're looking for, especially since you know, a lot of products that beyond price and value, they're looking for that uniqueness. So how do you showcase the uniqueness unless they specifically know what they're looking for? Um, so you know, I think it's more tactical sales in the context of re-commerce versus you know, also looking forward and thinking about the opportunities that you might have from you know, 
going forward, the products that, you know, how you can use all of that detail and the shifts in how they're created and made. That's great. Um, and this has been super helpful, I know, for me and understanding. I'm really excited to see where eBay ultimately lands with this because this is this can really be our time when we talk about pre-loved, pre-owned. I mean, this is our space. So really happy here to hear some of these trends, really happy to see them align with some of the data that we've already found and excited to see how we can kind of take all of this to the to the next level. So thank you so much, Michelle. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Excellent. So next I'm going to introduce Sucharita Kadali. And she's the vice president and senior analyst from Forrester. She covers retail and e-commerce trends, and she's joining us today to share her holiday insights, as well as online trends anticipated to continue into 2022. So welcome, Sucharita. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks to you so much, Cherish. And um, I am going to go ahead and have you guys flip to the next screen. I actually maybe two slides ahead. Um, and I'm more than happy to give access. This is fine. Um, more than happy um, to share these slides with anyone at the end. I know that um, people like to take screenshots and get the data, um, but uh, happy to email this um, later as well. So fact number one, um, e-commerce growth and penetration. It is high. It is getting higher. We went from um, like 17% e-commerce penetration in 2019 to 21% in 20, 2020. So extremely rapid growth. We expect to see even more growth in 2021. And what we have here is in the light green, what the projections for e-commerce were prior to the pandemic. And then the dark green shows what the shift is um, as a result of, of everything that happened in the last year and a half, everything that happened with consumers not being able to go into some stores or just choosing not to go into stores. So um, the big takeaway is by 2024, we expect to see almost 30% um, of sales to be transacted online. And of course, it's going to vary from category to category. Um, the main category that is um, underpenetrated online is grocery, but that for the most part is not really eBay categories. Uh, many of eBay's categories actually are penetrated more heavily than 20 um, than 21 to 24%. So next slide. Number two is uh, attitudes about shoppers. And I actually think that this will help e-commerce um, and will likely encourage people to be purchasing a lot of the, the items that are on marketplaces more than ever. Um, so what we saw actually this summer was uh, more positive consumer sentiment about returning to school stores, feeling comfortable, um, particularly as that was just as consumers um, were getting vaccinated and completing their vaccination cycles. But what has happened, which is the blue on the far right of each of these, is that consumer attitudes have reverted. And um, um, many of our concerns and um, areas of caution that we had actually in 2020 um, are returning. So what that means is that consumers are likely um, going to probably be shop choosing and opting to shop online for the coming months versus shopping in physical stores, largely um, because of concerns and issues with the Delta variant. Next slide. Um, number three is that uh, what we expect our holiday sales, so this is uh, wrapping up years of looking at e-commerce um, overall numbers and then growth rate year over year. So what you've seen is that almost a decade of um, low to mid double digit um, growth rates in the holiday season. Um, 2020 was an exception in large part because of the pandemic. Um, 2021 will still be big, no doubt about it, and it will show that um, upward tra trajectory. Um, but we expect that number to probably be in the low 20s, high teens um, versus in the solid 20% growth figure. Next slide. Number four is um, attitudes and financial circumstances. So one of uh, the good things about 2021, which should also drive some increased spend in, um, in retail overall, is that um, I just use one proxy for difficulty in financial circumstances. And this is from the US Household Pulse Survey. And it was looking at the difficulty in paying for unusual 
household expenses. And as you can see, the percent of people that are having financial difficulties now um, is pretty substantially different and much lower than it was this time last year. Um, so that is certainly good news for now. What we don't know is how much of these numbers have really been bolstered by stimulus payments, unemployment checks, and if that um, is going to, once they go away, um, create a little bit more of that financial difficulty. My hunch is that it won't because the labor market is actually pretty strong. Um, there's a dearth of um, workers in a number of industries, particularly blue collar industries, and they're all paying um, pretty well right now. So even if uh, consumers are rolling off benefits, they still have the ability to find um, pretty well compensating work right now, which should um, help to continue this trend. So next slide on page five, or slide five. Point five, um, net sales are up, should be up this holiday season. So what we asked consumers in a recent survey is whether or not they expect to spend more or less during the holiday seasons. I look at um, the net number of uh, the percent of people that say they're going to spend more minus the percent of people that say they're going to spend less. And if the number is positive, which in this case it is, that means that net sales should go up. So um, as much as possible, you want to try to find that 25%. You want to try to um, reach them, market them. And I'll, I'll share with you some of the marketing tactics that I'd suggest later. Number six, um, most consumers will be holiday shoppers. That's good news. Um, so what I like to look at is if you take a look at the second number here on this chart, which is the percent of people that say they don't plan to shop for the winter holidays this year, that number is 13%. I look at the converse, which is 87%, saying that they will purchase more. Now, um, there are going to be some people that say that there are going to be probably fewer gifts that they're going to purchase for, for various reasons. Um, and there is a minority of consumers here that, uh, that say that they're going to have less money to spend um, this year versus last year. But the good news is that the converse, again, of those numbers is the majority. And uh, the converse of those numbers is really where we're looking for the increase in overall spend come, to come from. Um, point seven. Next slide. You have heard about this. We've talked about this here on this webinar. This is not going to go away, um, but it is about supply chain dramas. And we've seen everything from the virus leading to fewer factory workers and fewer warehouse workers to container shipping shortages um, to labor shortages that are at the ports and through um, long haul as well as last mile delivery um, here even in the United States. And all of those are exacerbating supply chain issues. Um, the more that we are able to take advantage of what's already here, the more that we are able to take advantage of um, what is available and direct shoppers to um, what may meet their needs for what is there is really um, what we have an opportunity to market this particular holiday season. And I actually think is a huge asset for eBay um, because while other retailers may struggle with having inventory, um, eBay is never going to run out of inventory. And, uh, and, and as long as you're able to provide um, some things and message it in a way that's relevant to shoppers that can be really, really powerful. And I'll also share with you, I think that this next slide has some messaging opportunities. Eight, number eight, is about corporate social responsibility. So corporate social responsibility and um, messaging your values is something that can absolutely serve um, to your advantage. And this particular slide talks about elements like fair trade and diversity, that can be diversity in whether or not you are a maker or a seller. It can be about environmental sustainability in the products that you are offering and the values that you espouse. One particular aspect of corporate social responsibility, which is actually the most important, that's actually not on the slide, is related to localization and being able to help your local community being able to help a small seller, a small maker um, that is a small business. And if you can message that message to consumers, 
that, look, this is your business. This is your livelihood that you are using this to support your community, your family. Um, that is actually a really, really compelling message. That is something that people respond to. And uh, I encourage you to, uh, to put that out there on your product detail pages, on your seller information pages. Um, and, and also, if you, you happen to have your own website or you happen to have um, your own ways of reaching consumers that you, you message that, you know, kind of you, or also incorporate that in your own packaging um, and shipments, outbound shipments, that, that's something that can be um, extremely important to, to think about. Now, that said, you can't do this all at the last minute. Um, this has to be something that is in, that is baked into what you do. It's embedded into your DNA. Um, but if it's already there, lead with that. Okay, next slide. Point nine, um, service and company values matter. Um, now, these also aren't things that you can just switch on at the last minute. Um, but the things that we do know that matter to shoppers are that there's good customer service, that products are good quality. Um, so messaging things, especially if it's something that's not a known entity, remember, you know, people are not going to be shopping as much with the big brands this holiday season because the big brands all have supply chain issues. So, um, you know, this is a holiday season that they will be more open to alternative options. You still have to promote things like um, a, a strong returns policy that, you know, if people um, ask for their money back that you, you know, kind of so long as you've set your policies in place for returns that you um, comply with that, that, you know, kind of that your products, in fact, are good quality. And if they are good quality, that you're promoting and messaging things like warranties and guarantees. Um, so those are those are all very, very important things to uh, to keep in mind. And number 10 here on my last slide is um, this is uh, what I'd referred to earlier with respect to different touch points and how you can reach those shoppers um, that are shopping for a variety of different um, categories. And some of those categories can be durable goods. Some of them can be consumables. Some of them can be um, everyday purchases. They can be high ticket, low ticket, et cetera. Um, but what we have are, are a variety of ways that people research these transactions on the left-hand side. And as you can see, every single cell here is populated with a number that is greater than 1%, which means that um, for almost every product category, people are using almost every single one of these touch points in some way, shape, or form before they complete a transaction. So um, I just urge you to think beyond, you know, kind of the typical duopoly of like a Google or a Facebook ad um, to, to really think about what else can you use um, to connect with shoppers. And many of these other touch points often are less expensive, um, particularly on a CPM basis. Um, next slide is just my wrap up with um, just uh, some holiday to do's here. Um, I'm not going to read through everything here, and I, but I'm happy to share, um, you know, kind of the entirety of both the presentation and these, um, these recommendations. But for the most part, um, we talked about it earlier, but just reinforcing it, you know, kind of early, 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 the air is, is essential, particularly because we're going to have delayed shipments. We're going to have things being delayed and coming. We may not have the merchandise that we think we should have in November and December. There may not be much merchandise to have a great Black Friday sale around anyway. So um, the sooner that you can get consumers to, um, to engage, the better. Um, now, if you do have a lot of merchandise and you can have a very very compelling Black Friday sale, go, go at it. Go to town. This is a great year to do that. Um, from a consumer customer service standpoint, um, you want to be as transparent about messaging as possible. Um, we talked about that earlier. I can't reinforce that enough. Um, also, ample, ample post-transaction notifications, particularly if products are delayed. Um, and from a fulfillment standpoint, just make sure that you are not um, under, well, over-promising and under-delivering. That's really, really important during the holidays. And it could get you in trouble with the FTC anyway, um, because there are laws that say that you have to ship and deliver things in a promised time frame. So uh, you want to make sure that you are as honest and transparent as, as possible. Um, and wherever you can, you want to take advantage of things like store-based delivery, if that is, is an option for you. If you happen to have a local store, if there's a partnership um, that you can have with, uh, 
up with alternative um, shipping destinations. Uh, so that brings me to the end of my slides. Um, the last slide should be a contact slide, if, I think, if, uh, um, if anyone has any questions. If not, my email address is first initial last name, espadali at forrester.com. And uh, if, you, if anyone wants a copy of this, you're welcome to, uh, to email me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sujarita, um, for the, especially for those insights and uh, with upcoming holidays, um, and you know, kind of verifying what we all suspected with fulfillment uh, delays. Um, and also, thanks, Cheris and Michelle, for the great discussion about secondhand commerce, and Nate and Jeff for the seller updates leading into the holiday season. So we've gotten we've had a lot of questions, um, and a lot of them have been answered already. So thank you to the sellers for for doing that. Um, and we've got a few more that we're going to touch in on. Um, also, when you all signed in for seller check in, uh, we'd also ask um, ask for questions, and we'll be answering a few of those today, uh, kind of in advance. So first, I'm going to touch base on something that's been hot over the last couple of weeks, which is. Um, Item, item specifics and the category changes. And so we've had a number of questions that have been, been addressed, so I'm not gonna cover those. Um, but as of this past Tuesday, all the listings that um, have been moved to their final destination categories. And so you can look for your categories, revising items, updating items, specifics where needed. And we encourage you to update your listings with item specifics that are showing required soon. But no, those won't be required until February 22nd. So if you're in the throes of Q4, don't feel pressured that you have to complete those right now. Um, you have time. And then um, all other item specifics that are recommended or optional, you know, these are optional or recommended. So don't feel forced to fill in every single one, especially during the busy time of the year. Um, some item specifics have been renamed and the value you originally provided has been copied over to the new item specific. So you don't need to add these item specifics. Some categories were retired. Um, we've kind of flattened the categories and replaced by product-based categories. You and your buyers can still find the items you're looking for, simply browse to the product category of your choice and use the filters to refine. And so the, the left-hand navigation is gonna become more and more important. And you can learn more about item specifics category changes in our updated post in the community. So it's in the seller board. We've got a pinned post at the top with lots of feedback and our category uh, team has been in posting and providing an update uh, earlier this week on Tuesday. So let's kick into a couple of questions with the few minutes that we have last, left. Uh, in our last seller check-in, uh, we had a few questions about drop in sales volume. Um, speculation that promoted listing advanced is the reason behind those drop in sales. Um, so I'm going to take this one. Uh, there, there are a lot of common variables um, that can cause a decline in sales. Um, due to the recent increase in customer escalations, our teams are actively investigating the, the reports on PLA uh, or promoted listing advance. Um, and a number of factors can also cause an increase or decrease in your campaign's visibility, clicks, sales, including buyer traffic or demand, seasonality, changes to competition, landscape. You can imagine more, more inventory coming into your, into your space is gonna mean uh, an impact on visibility or, or sales as well. So um, a lot of things uh, can take an, uh, an impact. Um, next question is um, one for Nate. And so Nate, um, question is, what is the best procedure in pricing shipping fees? Should I make it make it free shipping or charge for shipping? And what would be the best price to charge for shipping a box that is four ounces? Ah, great question. Um, you know, it's really up to the sellers if they want to offer uh, shipping for free to buyers or shipping paid to buyers. I think uh, I'd encourage you to look at the type of inventory that you have and see what the competition of that same type of inventory is often selling at, both on the price and how the shipping is offered. Um, personally, I think I love listing with free shipping because as a, as a shopper, I often filter and look for items with free shipping, but that's just how I behave. Um, what probably is the most important thing is that you consider the total price to the end consumer. So if that's a, 
let's say $25 item with free shipping, or it's $20 for the item price with $5 shipping. Uh, at the end of the day, the buyer is going to pay the same amount of $25 totally. Um, so think about how you want your listings to show up. And then to the question of a five ounce shipment, uh, I generally would start with USPS first class. They're uh, first class package. They're the most competitive rates for items under a pound that still have great delivery speeds. Great, thank you, Nate. Uh, and Cheris, I think um, you may end up getting the last question today get, as I'm looking at the clock. Um, can you can you talk a little bit about what styles are re-emerging for both men and women in fashion? Sure. Um, well, I think if we just push them all together, what one trend we're seeing is that the things that are popping are the things that aren't necessarily specific to men or women, right? Like bigger watch sizes or women are buying as well as men. Um, sneakers, we're seeing more women buying men's sneakers. But if, I, if we want to talk specifically to clothing, we are seeing that people are buying clothing that they can go out in, right? That's not just as much with the elastic pants and waistbands and things like that. Um, people are buying jeans, buying heels, buying clothes to go out or for, or for a, a wedding. You know, so we are starting to see, even though there are certain places with lockdowns and masks, people are ready to wear what I would call real clothes again, instead of just the, the waist up. So we are seeing, seeing that as, as a big trend. And then, but as I said, even even in a bigger way, just these kind of things that aren't necessarily men's or women's, or even if something is called a men's watch, females are still buying it and vice versa. So it sounds like uh, people are beginning to kind of come out of the, the COVID phase of clothing. Definitely, I, yes, I know I am. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. So I think that's all the time we have for questions. Um, I do wanna uh, cover off on a few other things. Um, we know that all of the sellers will be uh, busy uh, during the holidays, especially the next month. So we are not gonna have a seller check-in in in the month of November. And we will regroup in December, on December 16th, uh, for an end of the year celebration. We'll hear from eBay executives and sellers on the end of the year recaps. And I look forward into 2022. Uh, We're putting the link in the chat. um, So sign up now and, and so you'll get a reminder closer to the event. We'll be popping a survey on your screen when we wrap up at the, at the end of the event. And I really encourage you to complete it. It helps us um, make this a better forum for all of you uh, in, in the future. And please ch- check out our dedicated events board on community to view a few of the questions and answers from today's session. And we'll be sharing some of the slides from today's presentation. You can access this at the link being shared in the, in the chat now. It's ebay.com forward slash community forward slash seller check-in. So thank you all for attending today. We hope you can take away a lot of the key insights and share them with your communities. And thank you again to Nate, Jeff, Charis, Michelle, and Sucharita. We'll be sharing the recording on eBay for Business YouTube and Facebook in the next few days. Thank you again for your great questions and we'll see you again in December.